It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. This is Kyle Hyman, and joining us on the phone is Michael Litchens, who's going to talk with us about the world's most famous exorcist, who he describes in the book. He says whenever people would say that he was the most famous exorcist, he would always say, most famous, but not the most effective so, with us to talk about his book, The Devil is Afraid of Me, The Life and Work of the World's Most Famous Exorcist, is Michael Lichens. Thanks for being here, Michael. Thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you. Uh, so, according to the book, Father Amworth did at least 100,000 exorcisms, which, as I understand it, that's not necessarily 100,000 people, because no. sometimes it takes multiple exorcisms per person. To, to get these demons out. It's such a fascinating story. Can you start by just telling us a little bit about who Father Amworth is? Uh, well, the sum of up, it can be really difficult. He lived almost what I would call an unbelievable life. I keep wondering when the biopic will come out, but we'll yeah. see. But he was born in Medina and had the chance to meet two very saintly men who greatly influenced him. One of them was uh, Blessed Giacomo Albertoni, who founded the Society of St. Paul. And that would be who he would join. He also had the pleasure of meeting Padre Pio hmm. earlier. And both these figures would really stand to influence his life. And for the years he was just a normal parish priest, that was true. But even more so, about the 1980s, he was elevated to, I won't, depending on which exorcist you talk to, they may not say elevated, but he was asked to be changing his vocation to that of an exorcist. And huh. from there, it's been larger than life. He's probably one of the few celebrity exorcists that I know of anywhere, and all, certainly one of the few Italian exorcists that Americans know. And it, so much so that even William Freakin, who directed The Exorcist, had to do a documentary with Father Amorth. And that and I do recommend that. I love William Freakin. But, hmm. And so through that, like you said, he performed 100,000 exorcisms. By his rough estimation, even in his, the end days of his life, he's performing about 17. Now, these exorcisms can be between a few minutes, like a three-minute prayer. There's many, many exorcisms in the Roman Rite that priests can pray. Mm -hmm. And so that would be a few minutes, or his most difficult cases, which he reserved for the early morning, could go on for hours, and then he'd have to see them multiple times throughout months and months of healing and exorcisms. So, is... Demonic possession more common than we might think it is if he was performing this many exorcisms? Well, yes, it might be more common than our popular imagination would have it, who think, you know, would, we're thinking of it as something that only happened in the Middle Ages or mm -hmm. our favorite horror movies, perhaps. But it's also important to remember uh, possession, the full on possession that needs the multiple exorcisms, Father Morth points out, it's still fairly rare and it's not something regular people have to be afraid of every day but yes father morth reported priests sometimes being possessed he's reported nuns having issues with it and we know this from other historical accounts throughout the catholic church so mm -hmm. it can happen it's something we should be aware of not necessarily living in fear of but yes it's a lot more common than we would imagine yeah because he's doing you know up to 17 of these a day it sounds like was that because mm -hmm. people were traveling to him or there was just that many issues in his vicinity? People were traveling to him, but there were also just that many, particularly within Italy. Huh. If you think of it from a spiritual standpoint, if the devil's going to attack any place, it's going to be a center for spiritual influence and really where we get a lot of our hope and our sources from. As Roman Catholics, we look to Rome where the saints are buried. Where is the devil going to attack more if he's really trying to take it out? Right. And so Father Morth being in Rome, many, many would come, and he was actually seeing way more. Even The 17 was only at the end of his life. Oh, wow. Earlier, he estimated it was probably double that. So, yeah, you can imagine. He was a very busy man, which is why in interviews he can come off as very serious, but also he had a joking manner. Uh -huh. and <laughs> Or as much as an exorcist can. All, every, <laughs> and that's one of the things we cover in this book, but... Yeah, the exorcism, though, he found he couldn't even watch news. He never owned a cell phone, didn't learn to use the Internet because he was just too busy having to heal the people who were coming to see him. And just for a frame of reference, I believe he passed away yeah. in 2016. So this is all very yeah. recent. Oh, yes, it is. Uh, you can watch if you even look him up in YouTube. It's kind of funny because you, 
you can actually hear a modern exorcist talk and see his mannerisms and everything like that. And several documentaries have been filmed with him. He's been interviewed by major media outlets. So it's well within my memory. I remember hearing about him as a child and I was surprised he was still alive. (laughs) Well, and it's interesting to have, I don't think he would want to be considered a celebrity exorcist, but really kind of, it it kind of reaches that status that he's, he's got this popularity and people know of him and have, you know, seen documentaries Mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. But then we also hear about exorcists that are anonymous, and a lot of dioceses will have an exorcist, mm-hmm. but nobody knows who it is. Is one preferred over the other? Is there a reason why some are well-known and some are confidential or anonymous? Yes. Uh, so Father Morth was in a very, very special position. He was taught by several other famous exorcists. He was located in Rome within the diocese. But the normal standard protocol is that you want the exorcist to be anonymous. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, for the safety of the priest himself. You don't want anyone who might have a grudge against exorcists or someone who might just maybe not feeling well wants to talk to an exorcist. You don't want them necessarily to be calling him day after day. So that's the practical point. Okay. But otherwise, yeah, otherwise it's typical for them to stay anonymous for safety and also spiritual safety, which I think is important as well. Well, and something Father Morth talked about over and over again was Mm -hmm. that we need to take the devil and the presence of evil seriously. How do we practically do that? That That's a great question. I would say uh, Father Morth's advice is to always remember one of these lines that he repeats over and over. It's one I try to repeat to myself is that the devil is nothing against the mercy of God. Hmm. And so whatever first steps we take, we have to remind ourselves of that. And I would say from there, a practical consideration is just be aware. Read the Gospels, start to understand. You don't need to dive too deep. In fact, Father Morth warns about too much curiosity on this subject. Mm. And uh, that is also something to stress. But the real message in all of it is always to remember that God's mercy can conquer the devil. And though he's prowling, we can still find final victory. We're talking with Michael Litchens, and there's a book out called The Devil is Afraid of Me, The Life and Work of the World's Most Famous Exorcist. And what are some habits or prayers that Father Amworth encouraged people to use to resist the devil or evil? Oh, One of my favorite things about this book is it has a few prayers of liberation that Father Amworth used. By the way, you probably know already a few prayers of liberation. If you know the Our Father, for example, hmm. is a powerful prayer against the devil. Or even just saying the name of Jesus can be an extremely powerful prayer. So in many ways, we already know some of the prayers. But also he had invocations against the devil, calling upon St. Michael and the Blessed Virgin Mary for assistance, but ultimately calling upon God's mercy. And if that is something in people, if that's a practice anyone has, that is always a good thing that Father Morth encourages to even just remember to say the name of a saint or of the Blessed Virgin Mary and to ask them to help in protection, cleansing, and healing. There's so many interesting topics in here. And there's, oh, yeah. I mean, talking about clairvoyance and different things. One of the things that's tackled in the book, maybe give a sample of something, is sure. spells. And I think a lot of times we think of spells as fiction, something that's in books and movies, but not something that happens in real life. (laughs) Can you explain what spells they're talking about in the book? So in the book, Father Morth refers to a cultus, which is, or in Italian culture, this is not too uncommon, where you would go find a spell caster of some kind and pay them to cast a spell against your enemy. It's mostly to do them harm, but it could also mean to spiritually lead them away. But typically, their spells to do financial harm, to take away your property in the old days, maybe poison your cow, Hmm. things of that nature. And what Father Morth notes is that he, as an exorcist, in fact, had been warned by his mentor, Father Candido, another fairly famous exorcist within Italy, that exorcists are battered daily by spells from various people. And this can be people who are either deceived or people who actually do have malicious intent. And uh, Father Morth warns that most of the time they don't work. Most wizards and witches are charlatans, but there are the rare real ones. And they can 
basically call upon the name of a devil, or maybe they'll tell themselves the name of a devil is in fact the name of an ancient god. This is where it starts to look like the exorcist, and they'll ask upon that devil to cast some type of spell, cause an effect in this person's life for me. And the idea is, is you'll owe this devil a favor later. And if you know anything about folklore, you never want to owe the devil a favor uh, or the mafia or the loan shark. He's right up there. Right. And so many people, wizards will actually cast these spells and find that they come right back upon them. And it sounds very weird, but like I said, most of these folks are charlatans, but occasionally you find those weird, good ones, good being the uh, an operative word here only, but find those ones who are casting real spells and co- intending to cause real harm upon people. And that's what he noticed as an exorcist, particularly. Well, and another thing, and I imagine this might be a little bit of crossover here, was there's sure. four methods a demon uses to enter souls. Can you mm-hmm. talk about some of these things that maybe we're unaware of or things to look out for? Yes. Uh, one of them I mentioned a little bit earlier. There's the door that can of curiosity that can lead to obsession. And this can be an obsession that can start very innocently, and it can start with just a curiosity, like this is something I think about with horror films. And then those things can quickly lead down a path to uh, they see curiosity kills the cat in this case over time. But yes, from there uh, with the obsession, you then can move on to vexation. And this is where you open yourself up. You called up, maybe you've casted a few spells, played around a little bit with a book you shouldn't have bought. And now there's physical disturbances. Poltergeist activity is a thing that Father Amorth has talked about. Hmm. And that's where physical objects are moving seemingly by themselves. And that's always a, especially this is a horror movie trope, and I always wonder why this keeps being a trope, but then I keep reading these stories, but people see a physical disturbance, decide they want to talk to the ghost, and this quickly leads from those physical uh, manifestations to something that is now malicious and inhuman in intent. And then from there, it's, uh, like I said, rare that it goes the full way, but you can go to possession from there. I know there's so much in this book and we're just kind of scratching oh, the yeah. surface. I just was kind of thumbing through the, and reading some of the beginning of it. And I'm, it's one of those that you just really do get drawn into and it's fascinating to learn and partly to educate ourselves so that we can avoid mm-hmm. anything, but also to know if there's something that we need special prayers for as well. And one of the things that I, I haven't gotten to yet, but I'm really interested in, we're not going to have time for it now, but one of the things it says on the back is you'll find out what his exorcism room looked like. So I'm definitely going to be having to, to find to look for that. So uh, where can people get a copy of the book? They can get it from sophiainstitute.com. If they want to read a free excerpt, they can go to catholicexchange.com. We have a couple pieces up there right now. And they can also get it from any of their local Catholic bookstores, especially if they like to read via ebooks. It's also available online. All right, again, it's The Devil is Afraid of Me, The Life and Work of the World's Most Famous Exorcist, Father Gabriel Amorth. Thank you so much, Michael, for sharing this with us today. Appreciate it. It was absolutely my pleasure. God bless. Have a wonderful day. You too.